Good morning. Good morning. Woo, come on, oh, come on, we can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it, it is so great to see you guys. We met many of you guys yesterday, but just in case, I'm Kelly Kamak. And I'm Starla Collins-Ross, and we are school development coaches for New Tech Network. We are excited to welcome almost 400 of you for new schools training yesterday, and we're even more excited to welcome another 400 new teachers here to serve at our existing New Tech schools. This year, our New Tech annual conference theme is Agents for Impact. We believe that each of you has the ability to impact students across the country. Whether you're in small town South Carolina or a school in downtown Cleveland, you have the ability to evoke change. We would like to introduce to you Paul Curtis, Director of Curriculum. Paul was one of the founding teachers at Napa New Tech Technology High School in 1996. Paul taught political studies before moving to New Tech Network to help spread innovation and education throughout the country. Please, a round of applause for Paul Curtis. Good morning, good morning. I'd like to welcome you here. It is uh, very humbling for me um, as one of the original teachers at the first New Tech in Napa, California to see 800 people here ready to take on the same challenge that we did back in 1996. I also want to thank you because I know it's really difficult to give up a week of your summer. Um, I don't think outside, you know, people outside education understand the need to kind of rest and recharge. So hopefully this week will also be a recharging week for you, but I want to acknowledge that you gave up some time with your family to be here today, and that's very important to us. So who's here? Um, among, in addition to you 800 or so uh, new people to the network, um, this week we're going to have a total of over 15,000 people here. Um, we'll have 116 schools who are returning um, schools into our network. 27 new schools who are represented here, and then um, 22 schools already kind of lined up to do some work for next year. So it's going to be a fairly big event, and it's very humbling for me um, when I remember that the, the entire New Tech Network consisted of about eight or so teachers sitting around a table trying to figure out how to make this work. And to see something grow um, for me is just a very um, professionally rewarding experience. I also want to acknowledge the people from Australia um, who traveled the furthest. Where, can you stand up just for a quick second? Where are the Australians? Oh, there they are, over here. Congratulations, the longest traveled. <laughs> I'm looking for more opportunities to visit your schools, by the way, hint, hint. <clears throat> so more important than who's here, why are we here? Um, What's interesting is when, when we poll teachers, uh, the, uh, among the things like, you know, summers off and, and uh, the great pay that we get, um, what r really inspires teachers to be educators is the desire to make a change in young people's lives. Um, that is kind of our true calling. Um, that's at the core of why we entered in this profession. One of the reasons I work in this field is I think about my daughter, and she is a typical 14-year-old, um, often on several devices at the same time, um, a digital native, as they call them. She's also a ballerina and a total goofball. So she's not an unusual kid, but she's going to be facing a very different world than you or I faced. And there's not a lot that we can do about it as far as changing the course of events, but what we can do is make sure that these young people are ready for them. When I taught social studies, one of the graphs I would show the kids uh, is this one. It, it, it demonstrates what happened to the number of people employed as farmers after the tractor was introduced. And as you can see, back in the 1800s, about 90% of us were farmers, and it took that many people to grow the food. And then as the tractor and then the combine began to uh, produce more and more food with less and less human labor, you can see there that it dropped down to less than 3% as it is today. The question is, where did all those people go? And the answer, of course, is that they went into the cities to work in factories and to manufacture things, and that's what gave us the Industrial Revolution. Um, what's interesting, though, is this is what our factory looks like today. It takes fewer and fewer people to produce the things that we used to produce. And so the question for us is, where will the people go? 
What is the value add of we as humans so that we can be productive citizens? When more and more technology is replacing the kinds of work we used to do. I don't know if you saw the, this uh, documentary on Watson. It was a computer that IBM built and they, um, they had it compete on Jeopardy against some of their top winners ever. And it actually, after several tries, they got it to win. This computer could actually analyze the answer, right? Because in Jeopardy, it's not a question. Analyze the answer and derive a question from that based on a huge database of knowledge they stuck in there. So if computers can access this kind of data, massive amounts of data, and compete against humans in something that we would have expected to be a uniquely human trait, again, what is it that human brings to the table? What are we going to compute? What's our value add? Um, to this economy, to this society. Uh, I heard once someone say, um, if a teacher can be replaced by a computer, he should be. I don't think that meant that as soon as the computers are smart enough, they should replace us and we should you know, be on the streets. I think what it was saying is that if we as teachers aren't bringing more to the table than what a computer can, if we're not bringing more to the table than digital worksheets and memorization, then we're not worth our, our salt. So as the technology increases, we have to really understand what it means for us to make that contribution. Here's another interesting little graph. It was a survey done of employers and the kinds of skills they're looking for, um, for, for employees they want to hire. And you can see things up there like collaboration, solving problems, critical thinking, the ability to um, verbally communicate and orally present. These are things that we've kind of intrinsically valued, but they don't show up anywhere in our assessment systems. They're not in the state tests. And so how do we um, make sure that, that kids get these skills when it's not being assessed and there's no one pushing us to do it? We almost have to buck the system in order to get kids these skills. Now, some people are critical of this kind of approach, saying, well, our job is not really just to prepare them solely for the new economy. Our job is to prepare them as, as human beings so they can you know, be, be happy and healthy, and it's more than just about getting a job. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, many people feel that you know, college education is a very important thing. Um, I do as well. And that um, a big chunk of our work as teachers needs to be getting them prepared to go to college. Well, we send off nationally about 25% of our kids to college and let top 25% go off. And it turns out that only about half make it through uh, and get a degree in their first five years. And so even by this measure, we took our best and sent them off to college and they're not successful. And there's lots of factors for that. Some of it's economics, you know, the, the increasing cost of education. But I still believe that if you take a kid in a very controlled environment like high school with things to do at the end of the period and bells that tell them where to be and lots of structure, uh, mom and dad having a strict curfew, and then you throw them into a college dorm, right, where there is no curfews, there is no structure, there's no one taking attendance in their classroom, there may be one or two big tests, which means they can procrastinate, um, and uh, if they want beer, they can find it. So. <clears throat> It takes more than just dumping our kids' brains full of academic content for them to be successful. They have to be able to manage themselves. Let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum. This is a study done um, about uh, students who dropped out and, and asking them, you know, kind of, why did you drop out? And one of the major findings that they, that they came back with was that kids are disengaged, that their classes are not interesting, that they're not motivated, the school did not motivate or inspire them. And some teachers will say, well, it's not my job to do that. They should come to the table ready to learn. We can hold that belief. That's, that's our option. We can hold that belief that it's up to them to come with some motivation. But then we're still gonna continue with this high level of dropout rate. And it's not just the kids who are dropping out that have this issue. What the research, other, other research has also shown is that um, the longer kids stay in school, the less um, interested and motivated they are to do well. It gets worse over time. And so I don't think it's within our realm to say, 
uh, to export that problem and just say, you know what, that's their parents' job to get them to school and motivate them. I think this is our job. It's to make them excited to learn and make them want to learn to become lifelong learners. And I think most educators believe this in their hearts as well. So for New Tech Network, our big driving question is this. How do we best prepare our students with the knowledge, skills, and attributes needed for college, careers, and civic life in a world of rapidly advancing technology, structural shifts in our economy, and a shrinking globe? That's the heart of what we're trying to do at New Tech. And it's not an easy challenge. There's lots of factors involved. So let's unpack this a little bit. What do we mean by ready for college, career, and civic life? For us, it starts obviously with knowledge. These are our state standards. Um, this is the content we want kids to know, of course. We want, you know, our science teachers want to know, our, our kids to know that life is based on cells, and our history teachers want them to know about World War II and the causes and effects, and our government teachers want them to know about the three branches. These are things that you have to know just so you don't end up on, um, remember the Jay Leno shows? You used to go out and videotape people on the street and ask them questions, and you just prayed they weren't wearing your sweatshirt when they did it. <laughs> But New Tech Network does not believe that we don't have to teach core content. Core content is, um, is, is, is knowledge that needs to be um, imparted on our students. But increasingly what we're seeing is a shift from just raw, pure knowledge to knowledge and thinking. This is showing up in the Common Core and with all the um, uh, uh, chaos around and conversations around what Common Core means. At its essence, what it was trying to do is uh, build more critical thinking skills into the curriculum to move away from just raw facts. And it's not, not just common core. If you take a look at the next generation science standards for your science teachers, um, we're seeing the shift there too. And a group of which I thought would be the last to move, the college board is actually adjusting the syllabuses of the AP exam. And, um, actually uh, use some of our teachers to develop curriculum for their new biology syllabus, which is much more based around critical thinking and problem solving and application of knowledge. And so um, we're seeing this shift from the, the pure knowledge to the knowledge and thinking, and, and really where that shows up is when we start talking about skills, when they're putting that knowledge to work, when they're using that knowledge to collaborate, when they're using that knowledge to present or to problem solve, um, that, um, all of a sudden, this knowledge isn't just a little piece of fact that they have to regurgitate on a test. All of a sudden, it becomes useful to some other purpose, some larger uh, goal in mind. Here's an important day, 1972. I'll give you a few seconds to kind of guess why you think this is an important day. This is the day that um, Scantron opened. Right, this, this, and it was a miraculous device. Obviously, you could you know, assess students, and teachers didn't have to grade finals for three weeks after they, they, uh, they gave them. That you know, Instantly, we could give students feedback. Um, we could very quickly assess whether students knew um, specific bits of knowledge. The problem was is that it kind of pushed us in a direction, because uh, not only for teachers did we have to change our questions to be A, B, C, or D, um, and maybe E, um, but because we could start getting a whole bunch of data, it actually changed our policy and drove the whole kind of standards movement. That now we could test every kid and efficiently collect that data and see which schools are doing well and which schools are doing poor. And it drove policy because we were able to uh, assess this kind of data. The problem is that, again, that data is very limited. It's not getting to the kinds of skill sets that those employers are saying uh, our students need to know to be successful. And so, um, as valuable as that tool was in changing the dynamic about data collection, it's not enough. If we really want to create um, thinkers, we have to give them ambiguity and conflicting evidence, unexpected results and alternative realities. Those kinds of things force kids to think critically about the world, but these kinds of things are not easily assessed in a multiple choice test. And that is the challenge, that we know where we want to go, but we have these tools that limit us. 
New Tech Network, and you're going to be exposed to this week, has introduced a, a whole set of knowledge and thinking rubrics. And these are really designed to compete head on head with that, that mindset of multiple choice testing. How do we really assess both knowledge and thinking? And so you'll be exposed to these rubrics today. And part of the design process of building a good PBL unit is to build in a high quality assessment that goes beyond just knowledge. If for no other reason we have to teach this critical thinking skills, it's because of the nature of the web. How many of you have um, actually visited martinlutherking.org? Maybe a couple of social studies teachers out there. This is a site that um, is actually run by a racist group. And so your kids who are gonna do research on Martin Luther King are gonna come across this site and are gonna be filled with a whole bunch of information or propaganda about Martin Luther King. Now, the stated purpose of their site is to get rid of Martin Luther King Day. They feel it's an atrocity. Um, luckily, on this web page at the very bottom, it's got a link to their, to their homepage, and it, you can really see you know, what their motivations are. Um, but many pages are not so handily pointed to where the, you know, what their motivation and sources are. People can write blogs about anything they want to now and it gets published out to the world. And very quickly those kids do research and wow, here it is, there's the proof, I've, I found evidence. This person said it's true. Um, our kids need to learn that what they read is not always true. Which really wasn't the case when I grew up. When I grew up I was being taught if it's in the textbook it's truth, if it's in the library it's truth because we'd pre-filtered information. That's not the case for this generation. Information is not pre-filtered. Information is just thrown at them with no sense of what is accurate or true. And we need to teach our kids to be very um, skeptical about what they read on the web. And that requires critical thinking skills. So lastly, um, as we think about these attributes or these preparing them for college, career, and civic life is this area of attributes. And this is where the grit and persistence and, and growth mindset come from. Um, more and more research, Carol DeWork and a bunch of others are saying that um, regardless of how much they know, these are the factors that contribute to student success. These are the things that differentiate the student who survives that college experience and the one who drops out. Is this persistence, this willingness to fail, or entrepreneurs in a new business, a willingness to experiment, try something new, and if it fails, oh well, let me, let me retool and figure it out again. Um, we clump all these together in something we call agency, that the student or you, know, you are an agent for your own success. You're working hard to make yourself better and you recognize when you fail, um, that it's something to grow on. We're gonna be asking you to adopt that, that mindset, that growth mindset, this next week and this next year. I remember my first year teaching PBL, in a PBL mode. It was very much like my first year teaching. Um, I had to relearn classroom management, I had to relearn assessment, I had to relearn curriculum development. It was uh, a tough but rewarding year. Um, and I was certainly better at it the second year. Some of you may feel like, I'm just not being as successful as I thought, you know, as I used to be. And that is perfectly normal for where you are here. <laughs> right, you're learning something new. So adopt this growth mindset for yourself because you'll need it this week and this coming year. So if we know all this stuff, the research tells us this, the facts are this, why is it so hard for schools to change? This um, graphic, you probably, some of you have probably seen before, is at the heart of what New Tech does um, and how we do it. It's based on the idea of Maslow's hierarchy for people that basically says, um, if, if you don't have food or water at the bottom of the hierarchy, really nothing else matters, right? If you, if you did not have air right now, you would not care what I was saying. All you would care about is air. As you get food and water and air, then you move up, you know, you get past your physical needs, you, you move up to more social needs and family and friends, and you, you end up at the top with self-actualization, which is, you know, the, uh, kind of the pinnacle of humanity. In the New Tech Network, we think about change in schools. Like, how do we orchestrate this change? 
And at the very bottom of this is a sense of purpose and mission, a shared sense of purpose and mission, that, that we know what we want to create. That if you've got 12 different people, and this is one of the big challenges in education, is you've got some people are saying back to basics, and some people are saying, no, we can't have computers, and some say, no, it's got to be all computers, and everyone's pointing in a different direction. There's no shared purpose, no shared mission. And so if you want to get change to happen, you have to have that shared sense of purpose. When you have that, you have to have a strong culture and professional relationships. Because if you're busy, you know, if you don't feel connected to what you're doing, if you feel hostile, um, you will not be able to put your 100% into this game, either you or the students. And so making sure that you have a culture that supports your work is very important. On top of that are the policies and structures you have at your school. This is everything from how long your, your yearly calendar is to your daily schedule to your block schedules or non-block schedules. It has to do with your teacher assessment systems. It has to do with um, how many computers you have on campus, how big your rooms are. All these things are structures that surround we as teachers. And one of the things that we have learned is that if the structures don't match the instructional practice you want to have, you won't see that instructional practice. I'll give you a quick analogy. So imagine um, you have a young a group of athletes, these young athletes, and all summer long you're, you're practicing football, right? You got two a days, two furs, whatever your community calls them. Uh, it's 95 degrees out. If it's here in Louisiana, it's 112% humidity. <clears throat> For hours, these kids are doing push-ups, running laps, right? Now, the first game that they play is on a basketball court against a basketball team. And the question is, what sport will they play? Basketball or football? They've been trained in football, but they're on a basketball court. You have a guess? They are going to play basketball. They've seen enough basketball to know basically how it rolls out. Their referee is not going to let them carry the ball to the end zone. Right, they're going to watch the other, point, the other team make points, and they're going to understand, all right, I've got to do it that way to, make, to score some points. They're going to have to realize that they have to keep dribbling the ball. The rules of the game will override their training. And yet what we do in education is continually try to train. Right, that instructional assessment piece, you get a training in you know, authentic assessment, and then the next month the school's got a training in different differentiation and a training in the new technology that they want you to use, and training and training and training. And meanwhile, they leave all the structures the same. And in worst case scenarios, we see teachers being trained in like project-based learning, and then the school leaves them in a 45-minute period, and, and they have pacing guides and all these structures that basically prevent the teacher from doing project-based learning. And so what New Tech represents is we tackle all of this. The important thing to do is say, you know, we're going to change your ecosystem that you're swimming in so that it makes it difficult for you to go back to the old ways. We're going to make it easy for you to adopt these new practices. And then we're going to train you to be successful at it. Versus the traditional model, which is, let me train you a bunch of stuff and then ask why you're not doing it. And hopefully, if all these things are aligned, we get to that top piece where we see the high levels of student achievement. And so this is the heart of the new tech work. We don't just come in there and piecemeal things. We do massive systemic change, holistic change, so that all the parts feel good and work together, and so that you aren't feeling like you're swimming against the tide, that the tide is helping you reach that student achievement. Our work really um, revolves around this circle. We start with defining our picture of the graduate, what we want students to know and be able to do. And those are all those first slides. We want them to have those knowledge, skills, and attributes. If we start the conversation with our community saying, we should all be doing PBL, or every kid should have a computer, we're starting in the wrong place. It gives, our, it gives the, the people who have different opinions lots of arguments to say why we shouldn't. It is very difficult to argue with the fact that we need kids who can be successful in this new world. And so clearly communicating that with your um, community and your staff and having that shared vision of what you want that graduate to look like is an important first step. Then you got to say, okay, what does, the, what does the learning need to look like in order to, to produce that kind of student? And that means like, what does the classroom look like? What does instruction look like? What do the tools look like? And then how do we build that capacity? 
And notice it's kind of circular, because we don't believe that we can define the graduate and we're done. That that is a continually evolving thing as we try to improve on what we really want students to know and be able to do, and how we get them there. So the theme, Agents for Impact. Uh, we believe that we are agents of impact. We have faith that you are going to make a big difference in your students' lives. We've seen it in our schools. This, uh, Right before the school year went out, I was lucky enough to go down to one of our first elementary schools that we're working with, Catherine R. Smith down in San Jose. High level of, um, of uh, ELL students. Uh, but I'm watching these little, I think it was a second grade classroom, and they're, they're standing up and giving a presentation. And um, they were almost as good as the freshmen we used to get. <laughs> and I started to think, Holy cow, can, I, can you just imagine what it's going to be like if they have 12 years of this kind of education? I mean, they're coming up to me and greeting me at the door, and they're introducing me to the project and what they're working on. I'm just blown away. And, and I remind of a different kind of a glass ceiling, one that, that says, well, you know, elementary school kids, they're not capable of this kind of stuff. And the truth is, they are. We're seeing them in, 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 the, in the schools we're working in. Uh, and if you just kind of let go, it's amazing what these little kids can do. Another really neat example, Tech Valley, one of the schools that's been with us for quite a while and has made some great contributions to our network. Um, they've got a project where the kids produce these solar ovens. Uh, and the idea is that how do we distill water and cook food um, or dry food um, in an area where there's no electricity. And so the kids are trying to solve a real world problem. And, and at the extreme, the, the kids actually got to go to Haiti and visit these communities to know what life was like. So the teachers would pull that together. That, that grew over years and years. But even just the start of that, they had to step back from that and they had kids Skyping with people in third world countries to understand what the limitations were and what they had to design. And before that, it was just a simple entry document that said, here's what we're trying to do. So it's not like your first project is going to be this thing where all your kids are going to go to Haiti. You don't have to think that way. Right? I don't want you to be, we'll put out some great examples here, but, but know that you can make it as big as you want to. Right? Your first year might only be this, but next year you go, you know what, there's a local community partner I can connect with. And the year after that is, well, maybe I can do something on a more national scale or a global scale. Um, Another great example of Agents of Impact, this is a Sacramento New Tech High, and they're one of the first of our schools to join the network, um, and several of the coaches and, and other staff members here are from Sacramento New Tech. Um, so they've, they've contributed quite a bit. They've got um, a, 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 a typical um, urban population with 69% um, minority, 68% free and reduced lunch. And so with that population, what's really amazing is they've got 71% of those kids going to college. And more important for a New Tech network, oops, I went too far is that 78% um, of those um, kids are persisting in college. In other words, they're continuing on in order to get their degree. That is huge for us. It's not enough for us just to send the kids to college. Our proof of success is whether or not they follow through and, and actually get their degree. So, you know, what's your kind of level of impact? What are you as a teacher in this, in this school that you're either gonna start or has maybe already started? This is a great study by Rand, um, and it was looking at all the factors of education. Now, we know the single most important factor for student success is their zip code or their socioeconomic status. That, that overrides almost everything else. But as far as all the things that schools have control over, the curriculum, the schedule, um, what textbooks you choose to purchase, what software you use, all those other things, the thing that matters the most is teachers. Teacher quality matters more than any other aspect that surrounds a school. And so we at New Tech Network invest heavily in building the capacity of teachers. That means giving you a lot of training, but also means trying to change all those structures that we talked about in the hierarchy to clear the path for you so that you can be successful. And so if you're here in a mindset of, oh, my school is making this change and I have to kind of do this, you're kind of in a compliance mindset. I'm going to invite you to think a little differently about this week. I'm going to invite you to think about this as an opportunity to connect, to both connect with your students at a deeper level than you have maybe in the past, and to connect your kids to their larger school community so that they feel supported in this journey of life for, these, for the years they're at your school. 
I'll also invite you to think of this as an opportunity to engage your students so that they never ask, why are we studying this? Why am I learning this? Is this going to be on the test? So that everything has relevance to them. This is an opportunity for you to make your curriculum meaningful and inspiring to them. And lastly, an opportunity to challenge your kids to think much deeper about the curriculum than the standardized test might have you do. An opportunity to make them become the historians or scientists or poets that you've wanted them to be, but that the state test may not have encouraged you to make them that way. In short, I'm asking you to become the teacher you've always wanted to be. None of us wanted to be that Ferris Bueller's teacher, right? You know, wah, 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 Bueller, Bueller. We did not sign up to be that teacher. And yet some of the constraints, some of the structural policies have kind of pushed us in that direction. I invite you to think about this opportunity as an opportunity to be that powerful teacher, that one that the movies and the commercials always show with all the kids in the hands up and the kids engaged and happy to come to class. I want you to be the teacher you've always wanted to be. Thank you very much. Have a great week and have a great year.